emergency. Hi, uh, my name is Ken Asimov. I live in Camel, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Me and my wife were just on a dead body in you know, our freezer. Dead body? Yeah. All right, it's okay, so, Is it a male? Is it a female? I, I think it's a female. I need a camel police there right away. The story unfolds in the quiet town of Campbell, Ohio. To effectively describe the story, let's rewind to a point five months prior, taking us just a 10-minute drive away from Campbell to the historic town of Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown is the hometown where Debbie DePaul, an only child, spent her upbringing. At 27, Debbie was confronted with an unexpected revelation that would alter her life. Unbeknownst to her, Debbie discovered she had a younger half-brother named AJ and a five-year-old half-sister named Shannon, both sharing the same father. The revelation came from a letter and a photograph sent by Shannon's mother to their father. In response, Debbie, along with her father, took steps to integrate themselves into Shannon's life. Debbie, treating Shannon as if she were her own daughter, played a significant role in her upbringing. However, as as the years passed, Shannon gradually became independent. Entering her 20s, Shannon became a social butterfly, often seen enjoying her time with friends. Despite her busy schedule, she maintained a tradition of dropping by her father's place for Sunday dinners. According to Debbie, Shannon remained present for family birthdays and holidays. However, in 2017, a noticeable shift occurred. Debbie's birthday passed without Shannon's customary presence, raising concerns within the family. This absence extended to Sunday dinners, creating a sense of unease. While occasional radio silence was not uncommon for Shannon, the prolonged absence began to worry her family. Initially attributing it to Shannon's busy life with her boyfriend, Debbie expected a call in a matter of days. As Easter and Father's Day approached without any sign of Shannon, the family grew increasingly anxious. Months passed with no communication, prompting Debbie and Shannon's father to reach out to her boyfriend, Arturo. In their conversation, Arturo disclosed that he and Shannon had a significant disagreement, leading to a breakup. According to him, him, Shannon had relocated to Cleveland with another man. For Shannon's family, her occasional disappearances were not entirely out of character. However, as their attempts to reach her became increasingly pointless, concern heightened. In a desperate move, Shannon's brother, AJ, reached out to her via text. The chilling response that followed sent shockwaves through the family. Who is this? AJ identified himself as her brother, only to receive the unsettling reply, I don't have a brother. This message, starkly inconsistent with Shannon's known behavior, led the family to suspect that someone other than Shannon was in possession of her phone. Faced with this disturbing realization, Debbie took decisive action and reported her sister missing on the 22nd of June. Upon receiving the report, investigators were confronted with the alarming fact that Shannon had been missing for four months. They initiated their inquiry with a focus on the confusing text message received by Shannon's brother, suspecting that someone else might be in possession of her phone. To validate their suspicions, detectives sought a search warrant for the phone records. However, the conclusive results were pending and expected to take a few days. During this waiting period, investigators carefully gathered information about Shannon Graves, aiming to piece together any details that could aid in understanding her disappearance. In her high school years, Shannon found herself associating with a less than ideal crowd, ultimately leading to her decision to drop out after her sophomore year. Later, she decided to live with friends and ventured into a profession as an exotic dancer. This lifestyle, coupled with drug use, continued for several years. A significant turning point came when Debbie, Shannon's half-sister, introduced her to the world of hairstyling. Through this connection, Shannon saw an alternative and more positive trajectory in life. Intrigued by the view of a different path, Shannon decided to enroll in cosmetology school. Today, Shannon gets to graduate. <laughs> Shannon's family, particularly Debbie, felt a sense of relief seeing Shannon finally finding her way in life. When questioned by detectives, Shannon's family shared that she resided with her boyfriend, Arturo Novoa. Detectives approached Arturo, who repeated the same narrative he had provided to Shannon's family that Shannon had left with another man. However, certain details raised suspicion, as Arturo still possessed Shannon's car and her beloved companion Molly, the dog. Molly, 
described by Debbie as Shannon's baby, was a constant companion in Shannon's life. They were inseparable, going everywhere together. Detectives found Arturo's story questionable, especially with these inconsistencies. The inability to pinpoint when Shannon went missing stalled the verification of Arturo's alibi. Despite a thorough investigation, detectives were unable to confirm the details of Arturo's account. Diving further into Shannon's personal life, detectives uncovered a disturbing pattern as friends revealed her liking for relationships with individuals associated with a troubled lifestyle. Acknowledging this, detectives turned their attention to Debbie for insights into other men who had been part of Shannon's life. Debbie revealed that John Scarada was a significant significant figure in Shannon's past, having been her boyfriend before Arturo. A swift investigation into John's background exposed a criminal history, including involvement in drug dealing. The relationship between John and Shannon came to an end when John was imprisoned. Investigators' suspicions deepened when they unearthed that John had been released from prison shortly before Shannon went missing. This revelation prompted detectives to bring John in for an interview. During the conversation, it became evident that John held genuine concern for Shannon's well-being. In the days that followed, John took proactive measures by closely monitoring Shannon's apartment and actively participating in community-led search parties. This unexpected turn in John's behavior creates a nuanced perspective on his involvement in Shannon's disappearance. Despite John's apparent cooperation, detectives maintained a cautious distance, uncertain of his true intentions. Through informal channels, John got wind of the burning of some of Shannon's belongings at a residence in Youngstown. A witness to this burning incident voluntarily visited the police station to provide an account of what happened. You have some information about this. Yes, we're, look, we're looking for this girl, Shannon Graves. Yes, sir. That's uh, been a big thing. I've seen it everywhere it's now. It's everywhere. We can't find her. We don't know where she's at. Uh, we have the case now, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. Okay. Anything you can do about it. All right. Basically, I know her ex, or whoever everybody's looking at right now, Mr. Arturo. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. I haven't known him very long. But it's been a couple years. Um, used to do music with him, that kind of stuff. He was living with me at uh, one of my past residences, and um, Shannon Graves also moved in uh, because uh, John Shakara, another one of her exes, asked her to stay there with one of his friends because he knew it would be safe there. I believe Scarada was dating her at that time. At that time when she moved into that house, after about. A couple weeks, couple months, something like that. I'm kind of hazy on how long it really took. Yeah. I believe uh, she left him, and when she moved out, she uh, went with Arturo. Okay. And he moved out as well. Didn't um, really see him at all after that. Some people call Arturo Anthony. Yes, sir. He, that's, that's, he has people believe his name is Anthony. Yeah, he just doesn't tell people his real name. Um, I don't know why. He just does. Like people that are close to him, like friends. Well, some of them. I mean, I was like I said, I was close to him for a brief period of time, and I learned his name. So, okay. I, mean, I don't know how secret he really keeps it, but yeah. everybody just calls him Anthony. I hung out with him briefly. I can't remember exactly what the date was, but it was late winter, early spring, somewhere around there. I asked him how everything was going, and he pretty much uh, he told me that she left him. She wasn't staying with him anymore. Basically, what he wanted me to do is, you know, he wanted me to help him get rid of the last of her crap that she left there. Okay. Like old documents, um, a couple of clothes, stupid shit like that. I figured he was being spiteful, and I kind of helped him burn it. But now, over the months, and everything's going on, she seems to be missing. Nobody seems to be able to know where she is. Everybody's telling different stories, and from what I hear from John... I've heard like three or four different stories from him, and I'm not liking the way it looks. Yeah. And that's why I came into... John's been calling us around the clock. And, yeah. You know. Yeah, well, he, he gave a damn about her. Yeah. Like I said, I just start, I started feeling like after, after all this information started coming out, because I didn't even really ask questions about it when he asked me to just tell me burn that crap. Yeah. But from what everybody's telling me, everybody thinks it's foul play, and if that's the case, I don't... I feel like I might have been used. We don't know for sure, but we also can't find her, so yeah. it's kind of like... Well, well, everybody in town is talking like that. Yeah. And it's starting to worry me, because uh, if that was the case, and if it is foul play, then what the hell did he have me do? When's the last time you saw her? Saw her? Yeah. Uh, 
Last time I saw her um, wasn't a personal interaction. It was I saw her driving down the road with them, with Arturo. Okay. I'd say that was sometime right after Christmas, I think. Do you think it was late winter when he asked you to help him get rid of stuff? Yeah. It was like end of February area. And he burned it? Yeah. How did that go down? It was just a um, garbage bag, felt like papers and stuff. It really wasn't heavy. One that had like a pair of clothes or something. He pretty much just grabbed some sticks, went to my buddy's house, started a fire, and I said, there you go. Sure. So of the things that were burned, papers and clothing? Yes, sir. Personal items? I believe so. I, like I said, I really didn't look in the bags. I didn't really ask many questions. I figured he was just being spiteful. So I mean, she, let, she said she left him. Hey, elaborate on that. That's really all he really told me. Yeah. She left him for some other dude, and that was it. Best we could tell. So the last people to actually lay eyes on her was around February 17th, right after Valentine's Day. There was a birthday party. One of the people, one of John's friends, she was at. And after that, John doesn't hear from her no more, and nobody sees her again. So what we're thinking here is um, if something happened to her, it's an if right now. It happened between the last time anybody saw her and when you guys were burning the stuff. Because I would assume he wouldn't be burning the stuff if she was still alive. But he's also driving her car and living in her apartment. Does he also have his own girlfriend at the time? When he got together with her? Yeah. No. no. Le- leading up to it? I mean, so, Katrina? Katrina, yeah, Katrina. Katrina Leighton. Yeah, that's um, not what I would consider a, a girlfriend. I don't think he's ever used that term either. From what I remember them telling me about their story, she's pretty much been there for him like a wife, but they've never been a thing, at least in his eyes. And that was honestly one of the reasons why I couldn't stand being around them two together, is they would just meh, 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 meh. You at each other's throats all the time, yelling and screaming at each other about stupid stuff. Um, are you talking about Katrina? Or are you talking about yeah, they would both, like, Katrina and Aunt Arturo would kind of just yell at each other over and over and over again about stupid shit. Um, like, she'd get overly paranoid and say, like, he's cheating on her or something with some chick off of his book, for example. She would start an argument over it, and, of course, the typical man response is, like, what the even talking about it's a chick I just added on Facebook kind of you know mentality and then it would boil over into I wouldn't exactly say like screaming it's just like aggravated yelling at each other Does Katrina have kids yes Are they his no no but he has helped take care of them yeah at a certain point they were on and off together for a couple of years yeah, I guess you could say that. Like I said, they never used the term relationship together or anything like that in my presence. Uh, in fact, they both kind of agreed that that's never been a thing. But pretty sure Trina really wanted it to be. What's your feeling on this? On the whole thing? Well, obviously I came down to give a statement. I'm worried myself. Like I said, if, if everybody at this point is thinking it's foul play... That's not good. That's not good for the situation at all. Over the following days, detectives carefully gathered statements and intensified their search efforts for Shannon. Simultaneously, the awaited phone records for Shannon's cell phone number finally arrived. The data, based on cell tower information, indicated that Shannon's phone adhered to its usual daily route to her workplace and back up until the end of February. Strikingly, this routine abruptly ceased in the following months. Further complicating matters, Shannon's cell carrier, noting no activity and a lack of payment, reassigned her number to a new customer. The investigation took a concerning turn as bank statements revealed a complete absence of activity since the end of February. Facing dead ends with the phone records and bank statements, both detectives and Shannon's family were struggling with a sense of hopelessness. Then, on July 29, 2017, exactly five months after Shannon's disappearance, a glimmer of hope emerged. In the nearby town of Campbell, a 911 call was placed, signaling a potential breakthrough in the search for Shannon. 
Hi, uh, my name is Ken Eschenbach. I live in Camo, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Me and my wife, we just found a dead body in the freezer. Dead body? The freezer in the yeah. All right, it's okay, sir. Is it a male? Is it a female? I, I think it's a female. I need to Campbell police here right away. Responding quickly to the home on Devitt Avenue, Campbell police took the homeowners into custody and secured the scene. Given that Campbell had no ongoing missing persons cases, local detectives reached out to neighboring law enforcement agencies to relay the discovery of a female body. Youngstown investigators, being just a short 10-minute drive away, quickly arrived at the scene. They were directed to the back of the house and into the basement, where the floor was scattered with black trash bags and a chest freezer stood nearby. The black bags and a Home Depot bucket had previously been contained within the freezer. What awaited them inside those trash bags was nothing short of horrifying. The horrific discovery inside the trash bags revealed dismembered body parts, with every part of the human body present except for the head. Detectives, in their investigation, identified a tattoo on one of the severed legs. The tattoo, along with the overall description of the body, closely matched that of Shannon Graves. With a strong belief that the body belonged to Shannon, Youngstown investigators took charge of the case. Stunned by the chilling scene before them, detectives couldn't help but have suspicions about the couple who made the 911 call. The homeowners, Ken and Jill Ashen, were brought to the police station for a comprehensive interview as investigators sought to unravel the grim circumstances surrounding Shannon's demise. We were talking about what to have for dinner, you know. I said, I'd like to make some spaghetti sauce or whatever. I was over there for maybe a half hour or so, 40 minutes. Came back, sat down on the couch, smoking a cigarette. My wife's sitting next to me. And she's just sitting there, and I just look on her face. You know, I've been together 30 years. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I opened that freezer up downstairs. And I said, and? She said, there's a five-gallon bucket and a big black garbage bag. I said, did you look in it? She said, no. And she was like, hey. I said, you want me to go down? And she said, you want me to go down and see? And she said, yeah. I she went down and unscrewed the hasp. Why? Because she said, because she wanted to see if there was any hamburger in there. She didn't make spaghetti sauce. I think it was nine it just got to and she wanted to. See, but it's your house, right? You saying, got a freezer in your basement, right? And, and then the padlock on it. You're paying for this guy, right? To run a <laughs> freezer at your house. Well, that's another thing. He said, I'll give you a hundred dollars a week to keep it. A hundred dollars. I said, Anthony, I don't know. If he, I said, Your rent's 450 a month. I said, I, I said, just throw me like 20 bucks a month or you know, whatever for the yeah. electric bill or whatever. He offered a hundred dollars. I said, I'll give you a hundred dollars a week. Well, the light had to go off when he said that. It right? did. I'm like, Well, first I thought maybe he just misspoke or maybe you know, I mean. He said, I'll give you $100 a week or or whatever, whatever. That's how you called up, or whatever, whatever. I said, I thought we were friends. <laughs> so I'm he like, brought a worry. locked freezer to your house and I offered didn't, to give you $100 a week. Yeah, well, I didn't know it was locked. Yeah. My wife told me. I just figured, well, you don't want us to eat the meat. I went down, I, I did it, and I opened it. As soon as I opened it, I just, like, as soon as I opened it, my stomach just flipped. Then uh, I just like, what the, just, what? That's how you store your meat? So I took the, I picked up the bag, it was pretty heavy, the, the big one. And I picked up the five gallon bucket and I set it down and I open it and there's a backpack. I'm like, take the backpack out, open up, there's a garbage, green garbage bag. Open up the green garbage bag, another green garbage bag. But it's frozen all, you know, frozen together. It's solid block. Right. So got these scissors and it smells really bad. I'm like, how, why would it? That's when I knew. I was like, why would you, you wouldn't put rotten meat in a freezer and freeze it and then rot in the freezer because it would be frozen. And Joel and my wife looked in and it just looked so weird to me. I've seen lots of rotten meat and thing working in restaurants and thing. And my wife said, nah, she said, just put it back in the thing. I said, no, Joel, I'm looking. I said, I've never, this is something, I've never seen nothing like this. I've never, no kind of meat or nothing like this. I had the other bag sitting on the floor. I couldn't get the knot out. It was like frozen. I just couldn't do it, you know, and then the strength to get it out. She said, you want me to get you some scissors? I said, yeah, she brought me down a pair of scissors. Well, hell yeah, you got to get in there Right, now, I said, right? I, I'm, I got to see what's in here, you know. And then I, thing, and then I'm like, it's not covered. The meat's not covered. And then I recognized the foot and the thing, and I just, like, my I, wife grabbed her head, and I grabbed my You knew it was a body. I said, I think I turned around, I said, call the police. But she didn't, she was very out, so I just took the phone, and I just, I didn't call nobody, nothing, nothing. I called the camera police. I only saw her girl four or five times, but she talked about her. She only talked about two things: her dad and her dog. Her dad and her dog. How close she was to her dad, and how much she loved her dog. 
and then she's driving her car, and he has her doll. You know, and that's what I, I started actually thinking. Maybe he did something. Because you handle things at the scene. We want to take a DNA swab for you. It consists of two cotton swabs in your mouth. Okay. For elimination purposes, mm-hmm. uh, we're obviously we're going to be looking at the freezer and right. the body and the tools and right. all that. And when we start sending stuff in, they're going to want right. DNA from you and yep. from your wife. Like that's, you, you know. Like you got me. You all right? Yep. Yeah. It's, it's just so, it's just like, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. outer space. I'm like an outer space or something. The detectives then interview Ken's wife, Jill. Jill Eschenbaugh? Mm-hmm. Jill, the reason we asked you to come down here is because you called the Camel Police to your house today for some human remains you found. And we believe it might be related to a missing that we had here in Youngstown. We've been looking for a girl for a little while. Um, can you tell me what happened today? Today, um, my husband went over to his wife's house. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about what to make for dinner. And I didn't have any hamburger in our freezer. So I thought maybe there might be some in there. So I went down and uh, I knew that the padlock was on that freezer. And uh, so I took a little screwdriver down with me and I just unscrewed it. And when I opened it up, I saw the black trash bag and uh, a five gallon bucket uh-huh. with the orange lid. And I saw that. And I just shut it, and I put the screws and stuff back in, and my husband came home like maybe 10 minutes later. And he knew something was wrong, so he sat down on the couch, and he said, what's what's wrong? And I told him what I saw, and he said, well, he goes, you stay up here, and I'm going to go down and take, you know, see what, see what it is. So he went down, and he took the screws and stuff out of it again and he opened it up I guess and um, he was down there just for a couple minutes and I stuck my head down and I went down the steps and I just sat down on the steps and he was taking that bag that black bag out of the um, backpack there's a red backpack he tried to open up that and I think I wanted to get scissors because it was tied real tight and I gave him a thing of scissors and he cut that open and then there was another bag of that inside of that bag and he cut that one open and when he tried to open it up it smelled horrible I just thought it was spoiled meat at first I was hoping that it was just spoiled meat and um, I said it just thinks too bad I said just put it back I said just wrap it up and put it back in the backpack and he went to go open the other one and it was the same thing. It was tied, and then he cut it, cut it, cut that one, and then he opened. There was another bag inside of that. And when he cut that open, that's when he saw the foot in the bag. Okay. And he said it's a foot. And I said no, it can't be. And I even went over to where he was at, and I was like, oh my god, it is. And then he, well, we both went upstairs, and he went out to the. I went upstairs checking my son, and he went out and called the police, and then they came after that. Legally, there's nothing wrong with you looking in the freezer. So, it's not a big deal if you were like, man, I need to know what's in this freezer, and you right. open up this freezer, but, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, is that what happened? I mean, I, I really was just looking for stuff for dinner. I really, I really was. What I'm trying to tell you is there's nothing wrong with you right. saying, hey, this is weird. I need to look at it. Right. I mean, at the time when I saw the padlock, did I think that was weird? Yeah. I even told my husband that. I said, why would you put, why would you put a padlock on Well, you said you guys kind of joked around and said, well, maybe she hasn't done Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Okay. But I didn't really think that that was that. No. I, I wouldn't even. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're kid around, but. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's weird. Right, I just would never. Okay. I still can't believe it. Upon finding consistency, 
in the statements provided by Ken and Jill Ashen, along with a lack of apparent motive to harm Shannon, detectives release them from custody, turning their attention to the man who delivered the freezer to Ken's house, identified as Arturo Novoa, also known as Anthony Gonzalez, and Shannon's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance. Investigators took a decisive step, relying on Ken's identification and the fact that Shannon's name was on the lease. Detectives secured a search warrant for Arturo and his girlfriend Katrina Layton's residence, which happened to be Shannon former apartment. The apartment search produced chilling discoveries for detectives. A large meat cleaver lodged in the front door frame raised immediate concerns. Adding to the evidence, they found a lease agreement signed by Arturo for a different property. However, the most incriminating find was an owner's manual for the same model of a freezer that housed Shannon's dismembered body. Further complicating the situation, detectives collected samples of what appeared to be blood on the apartment walls. This, combined with the freezer manual and other circumstantial evidence, evidence provided enough grounds for obtaining arrest warrants for both Arturo and Katrina. The question is, where was she between February and July? I, I don't know. I didn't right even... now, she's in your freezer. Well, I, so. that, that I didn't know. Oh, okay. You know, I told you about 10 times that the missing girl is dead in your freezer. It, I'm looking for some kind of reaction. I, 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 because you don't I'm, look shocked at all. Yeah. No, it's not that. I'm just trying to process everything. Oh, okay. Let me ask you something. Forget all this. Did you kill her? Hell no. Were you there when she was killed? No. Okay. What? Well, sure looks like you did. No, what do you mean it looks like I did? She's in your freezer. The one you paid for. So it kind of looks like you killed her. I can't sit in this room with the door shut. I'm getting claustrophobic. You use the small rooms. I didn't do anything to this girl. You use the small rooms. How are you going to accuse me of this? What the f***, man? Detectives then speak with Arturo. You must be serious enough to pull me out of work. Yeah. I wouldn't do that if I didn't have to. I must have on four hours of work today. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you your rights. I'm going to tell you what changed. And I'm going to have questions for you. Okay. You may want to answer them. You may not. You may have questions for me. I don't know. You're definitely under arrest. I wouldn't have... Sent them out there if there wasn't a warrant for your arrest. Let me start out by reading you back. I don't have to answer anything now, even though I'm signing this, right? But no, it's just, just allowing you to question. Me. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to answer anything you don't want to. Okay. Um, the other day I asked you about the rumors about you burning things up. Yes. Okay. You told me you did. Correct. Okay. Is that still true? Correct. You did not burn things up? I did not. Okay. Did you, at any point, take a freezer to a house in Camel? I did not. You did not? I did not. Okay. So you didn't go to Kenny Eschenbaugh's house on Devitt with a freezer, with a padlock not. on it, and put it in his basement? I did not. You did? And leave and go get an extension cord and plug it back you in. You didn't do that? I did not. Okay. Okay. So, up until now, has anything we talked about not been true? Everything. The last time you saw Shannon was when? Can't I don't remember. even know. Like the end of February. Okay. You have no idea what became of her? Where I she ended up? I do not. I've said this to everybody. Okay. When I told you the other day at your house that some people who were acquaintances of yours said that you burned her things up. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't understand how like acquaintance of who exactly means, because I don't know anybody that she personally knows. Which was talking about, about your people that know you, not her. Oh. Okay. People that know you said this that you're burning things up. Now I have people that know you saying you brought a freezer to her house. When they opened it up, guess what they found? What did they find? Why well, do you think you're here? The charge is abuse of a corpse. Excuse me. Abuse of a corpse. Are you being serious right now? I'm not fooling with you, man. You're 100% serious I would, I would serious not right make now. this up. Yeah, absolutely. I don't believe it. Well, I would be sitting here with you at, what is it, 10 o'clock at night, nine, if I wasn't talking about a body in a freezer that you brought you to a guy's house. I'm not making it up, man. I'm trying to figure out how all these people that are not her friends, they're people that you know, are saying this. Alrighty then. 
Wow. Alrighty then. With Arturo maintaining his denial of any involvement, detectives turned their attention back to Katrina for further questioning. I wanted a new freezer for the house because we needed it for the fridge and the freezer. Katrina, he's, oh. he's going to say he doesn't know nothing about no freezer and you're making that up. He... Well then how did her, how did her body get in a freezer over to Kenny's? Exactly. I don't know that. I mean, it gave him the money. I thought he was buying one. I, I don't, I don't know. Well, look, if you gave him money to buy a freezer, <laughs> and there's a freezer. It was supposed to be at the new house. That's all I know. I know I didn't kill her. I have kids. I have a job. I know I didn't kill her. All he's got to do is trade you for him. That's it. You see where this is going? Do you understand we're at the end of this road? So what am I supposed to do? Just tell the truth. I don't care what you said before. Just tell the truth. Tell us what you know about everything. Stop doing this and just tell the truth. It's, it's not going to get better. No, I, I, I know that. Okay. I just know I gave him the, the money to buy the freezer. I thought Trina, tell me everything you know about everything. It's the only way to fix this. I just know what he told me. I don't know me, what he did. I tell me what he told you. When I moved in, he told me that she was gone, that she left with some guy in his car. And that. I'm oh, sorry. And she left with some guy, and she took all her stuff. And then he said she was going to be back for the dog. And then she never came back for the dog. He said that they had an agreement about the car. That he was going to drive the car until she came back for it. And then she didn't go back for the car either. You understand this looks like you did it and he helped you. I know. That's what it looks like. And me sitting here trying to be impartial, I can't assume he killed her. I can't. He was getting what he wanted from her. The only person with motive here with you, hon. Understand? See what I'm saying? I get it, but I mean, why would I even do like that? I have my kids, I have my job. Your boyfriend. You understand how many people are in jail for that? It's not complicated. It's real simple. She took what was yours. Yeah, that doesn't make me a killer. No, you're right. I didn't. I was like, I've been the situation. Of course not. I don't like her, but I didn't. I understand her. that. But you gotta understand what it looks like. She screwed your boyfriend, then she disappeared, and then you got all her shit. And she's in your freezer that he says he don't know nothing about. Just tell me what happened. It's gotta be better than what it looks. It can't be as bad as it looks. I mean I didn't It cannot be as bad as it looks, can it? I don't I don't know anymore. Katrina, did you kill her? No. Okay. Did you take her apart? No. Did you put her in that freezer? No. Did you put her in Kenny's house? No, I didn't even go to Kenny's. Okay. So tell me what did happen. Because nothing you're saying is making no sense. Huh? You can't you can't leave it like this. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody's gonna look at what you say and think it's reasonable. Nobody. Sorry that my kids I didn't kill her. You understand, you are swearing this on your kids because when you go, you're, I didn't you understand her, I what's going to happen to you? I didn't kill you're going to go over there and you're not going to come back for a long time. I didn't kill her. This is it. You're, you're leaving. You're going for a ride. This is it right now. This is your moment. What you do in the next 30 seconds is going to depend on what happens the rest of your life. And probably your kids. I, I understand. Okay. I'm, I'm trying not to panic because... I'm not, I don't want you to panic. No reasonable alternative. Right? What do you mean? You don't have any reasonable explanation for why this woman's in your freezer. I mean, obviously somebody put her there. Okay. Obviously. Thanks. But if Anthony did it, 
Then he needs to fess up to it. Not if he didn't do it. Not if you did it. Because he's helping you. Then he doesn't need to fess up to it. And he has his rights too, you understand? I understand. Okay. That. He didn't buy a freezer. You did. He didn't buy an apartment. You did. He, he was did. getting what he wanted from her and you. Why would he kill her? I was just under the assumption that we were getting back on our feet. You're not getting back on your feet. Because I was... It's not going to be okay. I was trying to pay stuff. He's, I mean, he's I have going to jail and so are you. You're not going to get back on your feet. That's not going to happen now. That's done. But I'm telling you, I didn't kill her. Why are you asking me if, if, if did I take her apart? Why are you even asking me that? Because she's not one piece. What do you mean she's not one piece? You just I said mean, there's a girl in the piece. freezer. Yeah, though. well, you know what? She's in the freezer, but she isn't at all one nice big piece anymore. Oh, my God. So, you see what I'm saying? The only reason that we even think you bought it in July is because you said so. But I know you didn't buy it when you moved in because there was a dead girl on the floor and you didn't want your kids falling over. You see what I'm saying? I get it. I knocked on the door on July 17th. And on July 17th, that body moved. All the way to Camel. I didn't even know you... One of the days when I was knocking on the door and everybody was playing hide and seek with me was the day that the body got knocked. I'm being honest with you guys, though. The only reason I don't open that door is because what was going on with Tim and Tanya. Okay, but how do I know it's not because that freezer was on the other side of the door with a girl in it and you were like... Because <clears throat> that's how I would have been. You see what I'm saying? No. I'm knocking on the door and there's a dead girl in there. you got to be like... I mean, I get it. I get it. I, I okay. get where you guys are coming from. I mean, I just, I keep to myself. I work all the time. I take care of my kids. Listen, that's what you're supposed to do. I, I, you're supposed to take care of your kids and go to work. I don't care. You bought a freezer. He said, what freezer? You didn't say what freezer. You said, yeah, I bought a freezer. Yeah, my new house. Yeah, he said he didn't have anything to hide. Except the dead girl who used to be banging your boyfriend and now you got all her shit. You do have something to hide. You are the picture of someone who has something to hide. You see what I'm saying? That's the point I'm trying to make. I, I'm so confused. You, you, what are you confused about? You bought a bunch of shit for a place. You bought a bunch of shit that you never used for a place that you've never been to. For a man who's been around on you, whose girlfriend is missing, and now she's in your freezer. What are you confused about? There's no confusion there for me. What I'm confused about is, if you're not saying, God damn it, all right, this is what happened, and you know what, I hung tight for him, but I'm not going to prison and being away from my kid for the rest of my life. If you're not saying that, then i got to be thinking, you killed her. I'm telling you that. I don't know how she got there. I didn't kill her. This is going to be really bad. You're going to go over to the jail, and by tomorrow, your booking picture's going to be all over the news. Yeah, I realize this. You're going to be on TV. I realize this. For something I didn't do. Well. You're telling me that there's this parts of a body that are fitting in a freezer. I just, I can't even wrap my head around it. I can't, I can't. Who does stuff like that? Either you or him. Well, it wasn't or me. Both. It wasn't me. That freezer did not get over there by me. I know. Doesn't matter. I did not put it there. Totally agree with you. Never said you did. I did not put her in it. Didn't say you took it over there. Don't know if you put her in it. I definitely did put her in it. Wouldn't have took much. That girl weighed more than I did. Yeah. You can tell by pictures. Yeah, but not now she don't. I can't lift over 10 pounds. Yeah, it's about the size of the pieces. I'm just, no, I'm saying I cannot lift over. Yeah. Ten pounds. Because my back and my shoulder. They're trying I'm to figure out why, why break her up like that. Because he could have picked her up easy. You see what I'm saying? Everything you say makes it sound like it's you. You couldn't pick her up. Okay, that explains a lot. Because he could. He could pick her right up and pop, pop her in her. Not a problem. You couldn't. Unless you made her into small pieces. Which just happens to be what happened. That's just gross. I know. This is going to get crazy, and you have children. I just. I'm going to go to school. I, I know. And they're going to say, "Your mommy chopped people up. How many did you get?" You, you see what I'm saying? I, like I'm trying to put this thing down now. No, I, I okay. realize that. And this is going to be ugly, and 
know. Public. I know. Very public. I know. You understand that this is the kind of thing that may bring like CNN here? Yeah. Okay. No matter how bad it is, I need to know what happened to Shannon. And hope to God that is her. I mean, I... Because I, if that ain't her, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I know, I know that I did not do anything okay. to her. Okay. I know I didn't do anything. Tell me what you know about what happened to Shannon. Please tell me that is Shannon. Because if it's not Shannon, we're going to have... I don't know what's going to happen here. Tell me that... Tell me that is Shannon. I... I uh, Tell me it's not somebody else because I got some other missing girls right now. I, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to answer that. And I'm asking you. Please tell me that that is her and it's not somebody else. I, I don't. I don't know if it's her because I didn't put it there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's been dead a while. You know, I mean, we'll know exactly how much, but I'm saying March, like the week you moved in. She moved out the hard way. Katrina, I, I started know. knocking on your door, and it appears to have created a reaction. It appears that when I knocked on your door on that Monday morning, and I got no answer, and I started looking around that apartment, it caused this body to be moved in that freezer. I'm trying to think of every possible reason why, even though everything is doing this to you, it's not you. I'm trying what I'm saying is, if I for one second even thought that there was a dead body in a freezer, mm -hmm. I mean, considering the fact that I have my kids yeah. and everything All else, that. All that. I mean, I would have came to you guys. Okay. Because of the fact that that's my kids, that's, you know, my job, my career. Like, I know, I'm, I'm just, this is how it looks. I, I, I get that, mm -hmm. I just don't. That's her in there. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Oh, it's not her in there. Did you have something to do with it? I have nothing to do with it either way. Okay. Do you have anything to do with the girl in the freezer? No. Okay. I don't have anything to do with the fact that she's dead, that she's in a freezer, or how she got over there. Here's what I'm telling you. Okay. Here's what I'm telling you. Okay. I want to be able to go home to my kids. Well, I understand that, but you got to understand something here. I'm not about to trade. I mean, how would you feel if somebody said, well, I just want to go home to my kids, so I'm going to tell you whatever you want to hear. No, that's no, no. Not that's, what we're doing. that's not listen, what I'm doing. Listen, when I talk about... That's not listen, what I'm doing. I'm talking about bolt of lightning knock me is, off my horse kind of thing. This is, is what I'm looking for. This is why that's I'm, what I'm looking for. Okay? And you got to understand, you may have a problem here anyhow, depending on what it is got to talk about. I I need I need basically to know what to do to be able to go home to my kids because I had nothing to do with this. Well, I, I here, have here's to, what I'm going to tell you. What do I do? With everything I know right now, you're going to be charged with abuse of a corpse. And you're going to go tonight. The longer this goes on, the more it looks like you're just doing what you got to do to save your own ass. And I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's been eight hours and that's it. That's all I got. You may come out of this fine. I kind of get the feeling you won't, but you may. It happens. What I think might happen here is you killed this girl. I, I didn't kill her. Okay, well, listen. It's not that I don't believe you, but I don't believe you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because I have to keep that as a possibility. You guys are neck and neck on the finish line here. You know what I mean? And it, what it's going to come down to is who says what first. Period. That's what it always comes down to in these kinds of situations. No. We're past the part. This thing, this reuniting thing, you got to know it's done, right? Like, no matter what happens after today, this is done. You and him, you're not going to end up in the same place. I don't think. So unless you got that lightning bolt, we got to go. And I am exhausted. I, I just, I, I feel like I got into a mess that I, I didn't expect it get into well that's what everybody's and, saying that's what and i i don't that's I, what andrew's saying I, I don't poor andrew's like I, I think i helped him get rid of the dead girl's house because he he thought we were arresting the whole situation scared me i understand the whole situation scared me listen i get all of that if you told me right now this is what really happened i would completely understand you because this kind of thing doesn't happen to most people every day 
Just because I go through it 12 times a year doesn't mean you do. You know what I got to say? I like to stay in this room until you tell me the truth or you ask for an attorney. And I don't like to walk out that door until I have the truth or you ask me for an attorney. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is this. Stop everything else. Two things. Tell me what happened or ask for an attorney. Because I'm not going to be able to rest knowing that I didn't stay in here as long as I possibly could with you. So which way is it going to be? You're there. I can see it. I can look at you right now and tell that you are about had it with this because I am too. I, I just... Either tell me the truth or ask for an attorney, please, so we can end this because this has been way too long. Even I think you've been in this one too long. I just, I'm, I'm really scared that I'm going to go to jail or something. I need to do. Okay. I will tell you that I will keep working on every possible lead to do one of two things because I have two jobs. To either catch you for what you did or free you for what you didn't do. I have two jobs. Now, in the meantime, one of two options here. Tell me you want to stop talking, you want to speak to an attorney, or tell me what it is you've been holding back. Because if there's one thing I know from being in this room with you this long, you've got something that you're not telling me. And I don't know how bad it is. At this point, it really doesn't matter. However bad it is, things are going to instantly get better when you tell me. So, one I mean, or the other. Okay, because it's, it's like... Three o'clock, I think. I know. It's three o'clock. When I moved in there, he seemed fine with everything. He seemed calm. He seemed like nothing was wrong. Are you telling me that something happened in the car on the way home from Hagrid? I, I don't know. Okay. I'm I, asking you what you're telling me because you just pitched out a total, totally new scenario that you I, haven't said up until now. I, I just, I don't know if that's what happened. And Did he get in the front wheel in the car on the way home and dump a body that have to go get it? Is that what you're saying, staying here? I don't, I, I mean, does, it could be what Listen, happened. Is that what happened? Because you, that's a, that is such an abstract thing to pull out. But the good thing about it is this. Nobody put that in your head in this room. So, if you're saying that, I, I just that is such an question. oddball thing to pull out of your butt to say that, it's believable. I feel like it's a possibility. Okay. Well, why would that be a possibility? I mean, just because they used to both get to him all the time. Come out okay. The Did he tell you something happened on the way out from the car? Or that he dumped the body somewhere? He didn't say that he dumped it, but he said that they got into an argument. On the way home from the bar? Yeah. And what happened? And he just said that they got into an argument. And I asked him, you know, what happened. And he said nothing, you know, just everything's fine. And then, like, shortly after that, when we moved in, and she was nowhere to be found, okay. and I hadn't seen her since. I mean, I, I might have to get an attorney. I don't, I don't know, because okay. I don't have enough information for you. I don't have exactly what you're looking for, I don't think. I don't really know. I think, I think you do. I think you do. It's just he. I think you have the ability. He never flat out right admitted anything. I, I to think me. when you start talking about rides from Acre and flights and cars and body dumps, I think you have the right information. I don't I don't know why why we would go that far down that road and stop, but like I said, it's it's really late. So, I just I don't know So honestly. I, I can't I can't say that he killed her because he didn't admit to me that he killed her. Okay. So do me a favor here. Well, is that the lawyer? I mean, do I, do I, ha do I need to, do well, I have I'd to? I'd like to I end this, so if you say lawyer, I can end this, because I'm, I'm, like, exhausted here. I mean, I guess, you know. Yeah? I, I guess. I don't know what else to do. Okay. I, I don't know what else to do. With the evidence combined, the police formally booked Arturo and Katrina on charges related to the abuse of a corpse. A crucial discovery during the search for Arturo further tightened the link between him and the crime, a lock key that precisely matched the padlock securing the freezer containing Shannon's dismembered remains. 
The following day, investigators received a report from the coroner's office. After the body warmed up, a thorough process involving the injection of saline into the fingers enabled the coroner to lift a fingerprint. The identification confirmed that the body was indeed Shannon Graves. Unfortunately, due to the absence of her head, the coroner was unable to determine the cause of death, leaving a critical piece of the puzzle unresolved. The detective bravely conveyed the harrowing news to Shannon's family, delivering the grim details of the identification process. Shannon's half-sister, Debbie, was left facing the nightmarish reality, questioning how someone could commit such heinous acts against Shannon. The situation took another turn when the mugshots of Arturo and Katrina were prominently featured across local news outlets. In response to this media exposure, a witness who had interacted with the two suspects came forward, potentially providing valuable information to aid the ongoing investigation. So, the reason you're here is, you saw our people mm -hmm. on TV. Yep. Okay. You saw Katrina Layden mm -hmm. and Anthony Gonzalez. Yes, sir. He made some kind of internet order. Yes. What they shipped to Walmart to save on the shipping. Yes, sir. And it came in batches, not all at once. Not at once. But by the 11th of March. Yes, sir. All of the items that he ordered were, were in. And yes. what were those items? They were bottles of sulfuric acid. I, I, like, I don't know if it was like drained sulfuric acid. My paperwork just said, you know. Sulfuric acid. Yes. All right, bottles of them. Yes. Anything else? No. You either have to give me an order number or or a photo ID. Okay. But you verify are. that you didn't give somebody stuff to, to the somebody wrong person. else. Correct. And then your real customer comes in and they're like, hey, where's my stuff? Correct. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. So on the 11th, you're working. Yes, sir. And both of these people that were on TV, Katrina and Anthony, come to the place. Yes, sir. And tell you that they've been there the night before. Yes, sir. That they couldn't get what they ordered. And now they want it. Yes. Okay. So now you're looking into the order. Yes. And what happens? So then I go, obviously your name is not Chicken Man. I cannot give you this order. Okay. He goes, my phone must have auto-filled it in. Got it. Okay. Possible it happened. You know. I go, but I still can't give it to you. Because that's not your name. I go in there, his email was Chicken Man at like Gmail or something, you know. So I said, okay, let me go discuss this with my my manager and see what they say about what we can do. Okay. So I go to AP because this is like, I have already contacted them about the crazy boxes under Chicken Man coming in. So they knew. They wanted me to come in there when they came in. So I did. So I go in there and she looks at them on camera. She's like, okay, do they see? I'm like, they seem a little funny, but said their drains clogged. And that chicken man was her email. She said, okay, so can they like add an alternate pickup person? Because that's something you can do too. So if you can't make it in to pick it up, you can go back into your Walmart account and you can add somebody to pick it up for you. Okay. I will add their name to their account. Right. I said, I don't know. I could see, you know, it. sometimes that does take 24 hours to so update. AP wants a proper identification Correct. of somebody on this. Right. Okay. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I went out there and I said, if you guys can add one of you guys' name to the account to properly pick it up, then I can properly release it to you. Mm -hmm. Katrina's like, okay. And she added her name to it. From her phone? From her phone, right in front of me. Okay. I said, okay, well, it could take 24 to 48 hours that day. Sometimes it does. Yeah. But she got lucky. It went right through. Okay. So I said, okay. She gave me her ID. I looked at her ID. It matched. I so said, all she right. she put her name in, mm -hmm. authorizing her to pick, pick it up. It up. Mm -hmm. She did. Yes. Yes, sir. And then she gave you her ID to prove she was who she said she was. Mm -hmm. And now you have a proper ID. Yes, sir. Okay. At any point, do we ever identify Chicken Man? No. Chicken Man never gives an ID. He just stands there. Anything else you think is pertinent to all this? Or? It's just crazy. Yeah. You know. It's like eating me. Yeah. To know two people can stand in front of you and possibly you've done something so... Well, here's what you need to know, okay? Gruesome? At this point... It's scary. At this point, I believe this girl's already dead, so it's not... They didn't use this to kill her. Right. That's, that's not what they did. But to know that... Yeah. They were still staying for kind of you after they did it. It's Absolutely frightening because creepy. we were this close. Yeah, I know. And they looked at me like, how can you go 
about a normal day. As months passed, investigators carefully worked on building their case against Arturo and Katrina. However, as Katrina's trial date neared, she chose to take a plea deal. The terms of the deal required that she reveal the truth about what happened to Shannon. Later, detectives engaged in a third interview with Andrew Herman, discussing Katrina's version of events as disclosed through the plea deal. This is our third interview. Uh, we were asked to find you get a third interview because of some new information in the case. Uh, when I came to find you, you and your wife asked if you need a lawyer, said that it's up to you, you have a lawyer. Even though you're sitting here with your lawyer, I still have to read you your rights. We're getting a little more accusatory in our conversation here, and that's the reason. Okay. During Katrina's dealing so far, she has since uh, decided to cooperate against Arturo, has got herself an OR bond, she's out of jail now, and on top of testifying against her, she intends to testify against you, specifically that you aided in the dismemberment of uh, Shannon Graves after she was dead. Uh, no point did she say that you killed her or anything prior to her being dead. She, but her story was that Arturo came home one night. She's dead in the car. She couldn't help him move the body because she's too small, so he called you. You came over and until you took this body apart in the, the garage of her house. So that's why we're here. The prosecutors asked us to come find you, tell you this confront you with this new evidence and see what you had to say about it. So at no point did you help Arturo chop up a body. No. Katrina was specific about this, you being the one that helped him. I've always felt from our conversation here that you know a little bit more about what's going on. I've always felt that. I'll be honest with you about it. We've spent a lot of time in this room. And that much time, I mean, what I think doesn't really matter a whole lot. But I spent a lot of time with you in here, and I think maybe you know a little bit more. And I would much rather use that against the, the main characters in this. I don't, no part of me feels like you killed this woman. I don't see why you would. I have, we don't see any motive to I have no reason to believe that. that. There is none. Um, you're obviously closer to this than we are. You're in a position to know more than we know. If that's the case, I would much rather hear it from you and use it against them then hear it from them and try to use it against you. The way things are right now, without that corroborating evidence, I don't know how I use it against you. So basically, we're just giving bonus points to killers. And I don't know. What I do, that doesn't sit well. But that's why we're here. There's nothing I can provide. Okay. I've told you everything. I oh. came down to the station before you two even came to my door. I'm aware of that. Right. I'm aware of that. You came down here twice with us voluntarily. You came down the third time voluntarily. Now you're with counsel. That's three times. I'm cooperative as I can. Okay. Anything else? Despite Andrew Herman's denial of Katrina's version of events, detectives pressed on in their search for additional evidence that could support her story. During this quest for more proof, they turned their attention to Arturo's jailhouse phone calls. In a surprising twist, detectives heard a familiar voice on the other end of Arturo's calls. It was Katrina. This revelation marked a breach of her plea agreement, as her communications with Arturo contradicted the terms she had agreed upon. When prosecutors were informed of these unauthorized communications, they quickly revoked Katrina's plea deal. With this development, Andrew Herman saw an opportunity and struck a deal with prosecutors. In exchange for his truthful account of what happened and his testimony against Arturo and Katrina, a new agreement was forged. Andrew's chilling account of the day Shannon was killed unfolds as follows. After receiving a call from Arturo, instructing him to meet at Katrina's house, Andrew entered the premises. Inside, Arturo revealed Shannon's lifeless body to Andrew, disclosing that she had been killed in her own apartment. Arturo described her gruesome demise 
stating that she was beaten to death with hammer strikes to the head. Under Arturo's direction, Andrew and Arturo proceeded to dismember Shannon's body using a machete. They then placed the dismembered parts into a 55-gallon drum. At this point, Katrina suggested the idea of using sulfuric acid to aid in the disposal of the body. The trio purchased the sulfuric acid, and, in an attempt to dissolve the remains, they removed Shannon's head and torso from one drum, placed it in another, and poured the acid over them. However, as later revealed by a detective, the sulfuric sulfuric acid they obtained wasn't strong enough for complete dissolution. The group had unknowingly purchased an off-brand sulfuric acid that was not 100% pure. Faced with this setback, Katrina resorted to buying a freezer to house the remaining body parts, completing a disturbing sequence of events that would later become crucial in the investigation. Andrew expressed regret for his role in the crime. According to Andrew, his agreement to participate was driven by fear for his own safety, believing that he could be the next victim if he refused. In September 2018, prosecutors took a significant step by indicting Arturo Novoa and Katrina Layton for the murder of Shannon Graves. Faced with the possibility of the death penalty, the two defendants quickly entered into a plea deal. The legal proceedings ended in Arturo Novoa pleading guilty to 47 of the 48 counts, including the charge of murder. Consequently, Arturo Novoa was handed a sentence of 43 years in prison for his role in the tragic events. Katrina Layton, on the other hand, entered a guilty plea plea to charges of tampering with evidence, obstruction of justice, and abuse of a corpse. She received a sentence of 18 years. Andrew Herman, acknowledging his cooperation in the case, entered a guilty plea to charges of tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, and engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity. In recognition of his cooperation, and possibly the circumstances surrounding his involvement, Andrew received a 12-year prison sentence. The overwhelming impact of Shannon's tragic end echoes through the lives of those who knew and loved her. The so-called friends within her circle robbed her of the life she could have had. Shannon's family struggles with the profound grief of her loss and the haunting question of what might have been. Molly, once Shannon's loyal companion, now finds comfort in the care of Debbie. Despite Arturo's murder conviction, a lingering belief persists among some, including a few investigators, that it was Katrina who played a more direct role in Shannon's death. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.